Hello and welcome. So in this video, I'd like to explore and take a closer look at natural terrestrial radioactivity. As you know, we are constantly bombarded by ionizing particles which can come from different sources. Radon inhalation account for most of the 3 to 400 milligrams per year our body receives. But this number can vary greatly depending on where you live, how often you travel by air, medical x-rays, and many other factors. Aside from radon inhalation, terrestrial exposure comes from three main radionuclides, uranium, thorium, and potassium. All three primordial isotopes that were created in a supernova before the solar system even existed. In fact, all the isotopes from deuterium to laurentium and beyond were created by the supernova. But the most radioactive with short half-life have long since decayed into more stable ones. Notice I did not mention carbon-14, beryllium-7 and radium. These isotopes are constantly generated by nuclear reaction in the upper atmosphere or are steps in the decay process of heavier ones. Potassium has three natural isotopes. Potassium 39, 40, and 41. 39 and 41 are considered stable, but potassium 40 has a half-life of 1.2 billion years, and even with a low concentration, there is so much potassium in the Earth's crust, it's impossible to avoid. Potassium 40 has a powerful gamma centered at 1460 keV, which almost always show up in long background gamma spectroscopy acquisition. You don't even need potassium metal, quite frankly. Two pounds of potassium hydroxide is instantaneously detectable, or any other potassium containing chemicals. But I still try to pick it up with the classic banana, as you can see here, and with twice as much as potassium, the avocado yields good results as well, compared with the background here. Now I've talked about uh, uranium and thorium extensively in previous video and I'll get back to uranium later in this video. Along with potassium, uh, other primordial long-lived isotopes have a somewhat trivial contribution to uh, the background but uh, I think are worth uh, mentioning here. Next is lutetium, the last lanthanide found pretty much everywhere but often in low concentration. Lutetium-176 makes up about 2% of natural lutetium and it has a half-life of 38 billion years. Rhenium-187 and Rubidium-87 have no gamma for my detector to pick up, so not much to see here but background. Lanthanum-138 has two powerful gamma at 789 and 1436 keV, and with a half-life of 102 billion years, 50% will still be around when most of the uranium vanishes. I also try samarium-147, Neodymium-144, and Indium-115. Indium is interesting because it's one of those elements. The radioactive isotope makes up the majority of the isotope ratio, but it's hard to tell if I picked up anything here. Even after 24 hours of acquisition, and with a half-life of 441 trillion years, it's getting difficult to even call this isotope radioactive. I also wanted to take a second look at the uh, uranium decay chain with the mass spectrometer and try to identify the isotope gamma spectroscopy can't pick up. So I set up the mass spectrometer to detect all of these isotopes. As you can see, I uh, try to get a shot at bismuth-214 again, and with no hope to detect anything, I still set it up for astatine and francium. Outside of the expected overlapping masses called isobaric interferences, I did get good confidence factor for protactinium-234, radium-226, thorium-231, and polonium-210. The uh, francium hits are likely to be interference caused by oxygen and lead. Speaking of lead, there is four stable isotopes in nature, and the isotopic ratio in uranium ore is quite different. Lead-204 is really the only isotope of lead created by the supernova. But because we're dealing with a uranium sample, because we're dealing with a uranium sample, lead 206 is present in larger quantity as the final product of the uranium decay series. On the other hand, lead 208 would have been in excess in a thorium-rich mineral. Lead 206 makes up about 24% of naturally occurring lead, and as predicted, it is three times more concentrated in this uranium ore. But anyway, I did not talk about carbon-14 because detecting and measuring it is far beyond any of my instrument's ability. Beryllium-7, however, can easily be picked up from used furnace filters. I've talked about it in two previous videos. And that wraps it up for this one. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, thumbs up. 
If you have any suggestions for future videos, let me know in the comment. Don't forget to subscribe if you feel like it. A big thanks to my Patreon, and I will see you on the next one. Thanks for watching.